wait, requested wait. this topic and yes. then and then you didn't prepare I mean, anything and you showed up today and you forgot that you'd request it. You forgot that it was yeah. your topic and that you'd request it. Okay, cool. Just make, I don't make even sure know what I want to talk about here. Um, cool. Should no, we take some time before we start the show or should we just start the show? I think we should just go for it. All right. I'm going to do it. You ready yeah. to clap? <laughs> it's that. Remember that? No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's somewhat, I'm like ready to go. Uh, for yeah, sure. says the person who didn't even know what the topic was. I can figure it out, probably. <laughs> okay. It's like a lightning talk. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Function Call. Uh, we're back on the show today with Mr. Grant Glidewell. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing great. Austin, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty well, I think. Uh, yeah, we got a roller derby double, double header tomorrow. That I'm going oh to seriously so, That's gonna be oh, awesome. yeah oh yeah it's gonna be great i'm looking forward to it um heartless heathers are my team they got uh my girl bonnie thunders basically the michael jordan or lebron james of roller derby jammers really excited it's like a slippery eel she just gets right through the pack it's amazing and they are going against guns and rollers uh with uh Oh, what's her name? Uh, Scald Eagle, who is just a force of nature. So it's really like power versus finesse in, in the jammer head to head on that one. It's fun. Anyway, gotcha. this is not a uh, roller derby podcast. It could uh, be. Believe it or not. Yeah. We, we could just... did, did, did this just transition? I, I think it, I think you're an announcer yeah. now. I think oh. we just need to live. Oh, I couldn't hang. Dude, they do live streams. And, uh, oh, are you drinking some Virgils? Always Virgils. Nice. So good. Is it the root beer? Glorious. Uh, it's the black cherry Ooh. stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> Too sweet for me, I'm going to say. I used to love it when I was this a kid. One's, this one's really, really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, Grant, always mm. good to see your face. Um, you got some lighting going on or is there like some stubble coming up on the top of your head? Oh, it it still grows it's sometimes. It's, it's I have in. to. Yeah, you're really, you're really letting yourself go there. Jeez, uh, <laughs> oh, you're so rude. <laughs> this is a guy in a hoodie. Come on. Oh man, sorry. You want me to take the hoodie off? Would that no. make you feel better? No, you it might make me, me feel unleash, worse with you your luscious to locks on top of you. Yeah. <laughs> Like, uh, aren't you supposed to be bald? Uh, let me show you my hair. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, I think we are live streaming, so I should probably be watching the Twitch stuff. But, okay. uh, you know, before we get into the show, uh, let me get your take on something. Mm -hmm. I am thinking about switching from Twitch to YouTube for my streams. Because I do streams, I think, on Fridays to talk about stuff and, like, build stuff. Okay. What do you what do you think about that? Not that you know uh, anything about the street. Yeah, yeah. I so as somebody who knows absolutely nothing, but to be totally honest, like I watch a lot of YouTube. I yeah. I I I, I think the platform's fantastic. I think the the idea uh behind it and really what it's been built to do ma makes a ton of sense. Whereas Twitch is like extremely focused on it's gaming like that's what it was yeah. built around and so like yeah i i get it there are a lot of programmers on there there's a lot of uh people who who do stuff there but like i like youtube i like it a lot i like youtube but i think Aww. we should see other people ouch do you see what i did there with the lighting i mean the podcast people are just missing out but i just upgraded my <laughs> lighting it looks great oh it's just an instant uh really yeah, now really highlights my locks Yes, your like luscious locks. Where it's like my my uh, <laughs> yeah. caveman yeah. head stubble uh, <laughs> blends in quite well with my dark settings. Man, grilling you today. I don't know yes. what I, I don't know. I don't know what I had for lunch, but I'm sorry. It's not my it's usual. Friday, so I. It's Friday. It's don't care. Cool. 
Uh, well, Grant, we are on the show today to talk about a topic near and dear to your heart because you recommended it. In fact, it's so near and dear to your heart that you showed up to the pre-show and without any sort of documents or any sort of preparation, and you're just going to shoot from the hip. Uh, and you even forgot what we were talking about today. So that's how that's how today is going to go. It's super important. Yeah, which is fine. We we like don't really do a whole lot of preparing anyway. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to get any like, you know, misconceptions about what goes on in this show. But uh, you, yeah, you don't so, want to give people the impression that we're tryhards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know we can easily be confused or mistaken, but yeah, uh, yeah. So what are we talking about? Um, so I, I, I want to talk about. So it's it's kind of a multifaceted topic, and so like as a self taught engineer, this is something that has always it's it's always kind of felt like i missed out on some like some of the computer sciencey conceptual stuff like uh essentially this this comes back to like just general programming design patterns and the way that we talk about the approaches that we take to writing software right like and like as i'm saying all of this it sounds so pretentious. Systems? Nope, design patterns. Oh shoot, man! I totally misinterpreted <laughs> what you had recommended. So you had, so, you had no idea what I was so talking about. Either. Prepared for this show, I'm like, I was like, yeah. You were like, hey, can we talk about design patterns? I was like, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about like UI libraries and design and design tokens and the difference between these. <laughs> I was like, and you're I like, was yeah, wondering that's why not... your response you're like, yeah, was sure. like a little bit weird. You're like, oh yeah, we could talk about this too, and I'm like. Yeah. I guess if we have time. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Cool. Design patterns. So, all right. Maybe so, we should yeah. start there. Like difference between design patterns and like and like a design system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they they have a, a one word in common. And I think yeah. that's about it. Yeah. Actually, I mean, no, like on a conceptual level, there's a lot of parallels. Um All right. But... What what are Okay. Sorry. I'd, I'd like to rail to you, but you, you wanted to talk about this because uh, you don't have a computer science background. And you want to talk about like this, this fundamental principle or like, yeah, I don't know, but this principle that you learn in computer science that coming into the industry, not having that background, you hear the term design pattern and you're like, mm, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I bought this shirt. Like, yeah, it's my shirt. Thanks. It's, I, I, <laughs> I like, like the that pattern design too. Pattern. I think yeah, it's yeah. a good design. Yeah. 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 So like, I don't know, like, as, as a self-taught person and I, I have a friend who's learning programming right now, he, he's taking kind of a, uh, he's gone down like this Python path. And so like, I struggle to, to, to help him out, but I was looking at some of his code and I'm like, this is, this is very, uh, this is something that I think is very typical for someone who is new and early in their, in their kind of programming. Um, and it's like, we, we will sometimes call it spaghetti code. It's like a whole bunch of, it's like just a huge number of lines of if statements going down and mm. you start looking at like these if conditions that kind of combine and then you start thinking like hey you know this this kind of lends itself to maybe using something like a state machine and they're like what are you talking about and i'm like well you know uh you you have uh n number of conditions and instead of you know all of these if else statements that have other ifs and then loops inside of them uh, you have something that kind of handles what the state is in this specific scope, and then the function based on that state will return or or perform whatever specific task it needs to perform based on that state. Um, can, can I stop you really quick? Right. Uh, because if we're talking to, if we're trying to talk to people that are going to relate to this, maybe mm -hmm. we should probably explain like what you mean by what is spaghetti code. Right, right. So we, what I was kind of saying was it's this long string of if statements. And so, you know, I'm not talking like three or four conditions. It's uh, 10, 20 different uh, kind of if statements all going through kind of one function that, you know, digs into the global scope a few different times to, to kind of figure out what its state should be. And so it's the there's... Um, what what we might call like a marked lack of organization, right? 
like okay. as and you read like... through the code, you see somebody's thought process. And I think for for somebody who's new, that's really good. And this this particular person, as I'm reading this code, they actually wrote out in comments their thought process as they're writing this code, which I really enjoyed. I thought it was I thought it was neat because um, I I remember doing that. <laughs> And there's like links to Stack Overflow stuff, and he's talking about like I don't understand why this doesn't work and this does. Like this seems to should have listened like... to my mom. Should have been a lawyer. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, this yeah. this person happens to actually be a lawyer. That's funny. I wish my dad hugged me more when I was a kid. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> so, so in and and I think a lot of people who are like mid level career or senior engineers or just been around a little bit like you you can you can recognize some of this stuff uh, an old colleague of mine would say like some of this might be like a code smell um which is just like you have an instinct for there's there's something not quite right here you could do this a little bit differently and clean it up um so that that's what i mean by by spaghetti code is like it's just kind of a mess and not that it doesn't work right like yep. spaghetti gets the job done and there's some Ooh, what? There's some spaghetti out there that that uh, lives in code bases that that scale um, and that, that that should freak everyone out. But it's just the way the world works, right? Like a, as you dig in and, and start to, you know, work out in the real world. Wow, that sounds like super pretentious. I apologize. But like the, <laughs> the, the, the more code bases you're exposed to, I guess, like you start to see that even even in these scenarios with professionals building this stuff like it's it's still there um so it's not yeah. that's not necessarily um a problem is what i'm saying but when you're in interviews which a lot of people right now like a lot of my old coworkers that were let go um a lot of people that i know that have been uh laid off with just some of the huge layoffs that have been happening they're in interviews and they're being asked questions and they sometimes are just lost to even find the words to answer uh, some questions around stuff that design patterns would help them solve, right? Okay, cool. So uh, <laughs> basically, well, basically you've described spaghetti code and code smells and like mm -hmm. essentially code that's like all over the place, hard to reason about, hard to follow the logic through. Um, I like to think of sp spaghetti code being like a bunch of a mess of spaghetti. It's like a jumble of spaghetti or code and you can start at one end and you kind of have to like, like follow the string of spaghetti to figure out where it ends. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're probably dealing with variables that are being shared across multiple scopes and being updated in different places. And it's hard to track what updates, what, when. Uh, and then you're saying that the solution to a lot of this is this design patterns. So you've in, you've introduced the the new character. Can you give us a description of what they are? Can you, can um, you explain what a design pattern is? <clears throat> so uh, a, a long time ago in a uh, galaxy far, far away, uh, there were these people called the 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 gang of eight, the group of eight, the the G8 summit, they got together. It's a bunch of like C developers, right? Like these C engineers, uh, they, they wrote a book on design patterns. And like, this is something that I think is ubiquitously taught in like CS programs. I wouldn't know. Um, but that that's typically what I see. They didn't let you into the gang. They didn't, not in the gang, not in the group. I didn't go to the summit. Um, I was just, you know, doing my own thing. Um, but there's there's some kind of uh, micro level patterns and macro level patterns. And then you get into stuff that is very specific to maybe even uh, like a like a framework that people kind of follow other patterns, right? Like, but what is a like, what are you saying? What What is a design pattern? Just a design pattern is a way of organizing code to make it more reusable, more readable. Um, it 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 may get into uh, concepts like composition, which we're like not even going to start to get into. But like these are uh, uh, just kind of highbrow uh, terms for code that will be more reliable and easier to work with. 
over time, right? Okay. Do you think that's yeah. fair? Yeah, I'd say that they're like uh, tried and true patterns of uh, writing code okay. to, to accomplish all that. Maintainability, reliability, readability, basically everything that's good that starts with R. Um, <laughs> all of my favorite R words. It's great. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay. Is, so, so like conceptually, these things are are like really useful, and you hear a lot of people talk about them, and you hear some of these things in passing, like observers or observables, uh, encapsulation. Let me let me. So I am Just pull up to, the list of for design yeah patterns. for full transparency. Like I have to pull a list up because these are not yeah. things that are in my head all the time. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna say I am, yeah. In the show notes, I want to include, there's like a really cool uh, GitHub repo of, let's see, JavaScript design patterns. Um, yeah. So some of the patterns that I am at a distance familiar with would be things like uh, factories. Um, prototype the, the so uh, the prototypal inheritance uh in javascript this is a design pattern right uh decorator this is something that's fallen out of favor in uh more recent years but i i i hear the folks that were into it in, in its heyday they love I decorators it's a i think it's making a comeback don't call it a comeback we'll see <laughs> uh what, one of my favorites is is the observer pattern um I love observers. Uh, I, I lean on them probably a bit too heavily, um, but observers and ob observables. Uh, it, where I'm looking at this is is a website called refactoring.guru. Uh, it's it's a cool like free resource where for like each of these patterns, they will dig in and describe what they do and, and what they're good for. Um, I have found the descriptions to be a little bit difficult to follow without really concrete examples in mm -hmm. a language or framework that I'm familiar with. Um, which brings me to one of my, again, favorite patterns is flux. Flux is like the, what, okay. flux is what Redux is based on, right? So Redux in React. Is that a design pattern? Mm -hmm. Okay. Flux is a data flow management pattern. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's how a lot of like, Run in data store persistence layers work. Um, like I, I would assume, <clears throat> I assume Vue's uh, state management is very, very similar, if not the same pattern. Um, yes, no. Yeah, you, you bait in a comment or um, I, so I think you know. I I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it kind of depends, right? Because you, you could say about the same about React, where React and Vue don't necessarily react more so. Doesn't subscribe to one state management solution. Like Redux was, uh, Redux was one of the the leading patterns that follows, as you say, the flux pattern of managing state where uh, it's unidirectional data flow, and I don't, I don't know how else I would describe it, but but that was one possible solution but there was also things like MobX, which i don't think uh followed the flux pattern and now you have things like hooks which definitely don't are not flux patterns and those are more i don't know what what design pattern that would follow really um but but well, on the hooks, view side hooks, yeah hooks are uh are still part of like so it doesn't break anything when it comes to the flux pattern and Redux. It's just a, a different paradigm. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, right. Okay. Fair enough. But yeah, essentially, like I, I kind of agree with you. Uh, looking into some of these things, because I, I went through. I, I also don't have a computer science background, and I've spent uh, a good portion of my career, like periodically trying to fill in the gaps in those in that knowledge or lack thereof. Uh, and so, yeah, I went through a phase of like, oh, let me let me study some design patterns and understand 
what a design pattern is, which ones are available. Once again, I think that we're kind of skirting around the idea of like not actually saying what they are or, or kind of, yeah, like getting around saying it or describing them. Um, but again, it's just like different, different patterns of writing code to build applications or to build programs. And so they're tried and true, they're, they're time tested and you can apply the same design pattern across multiple languages. And so it's good to learn these because underneath a lot of frameworks and libraries and tools implement these design patterns in whatever language you're talking about, right? But it's good to know how they work so that in certain scenarios, uh, different design patterns are better for certain things. To like, like you, like the, the, the computer science or software engineering industry hasn't hasn't uh, really come up with a novel idea in a, in a long time. We're just like rehashing a lot of the same things. And so rather than rather than struggle through uh, building applications from scratch, once you understand the language, you can study patterns sort of like studying chess moves or, or like chess uh, plays, you know, that's what I would describe a, a design pattern like and then you can just like trust the formula of this pattern in the right scenario uh yeah yeah i i think you're you're getting to the meat of it here which is that this is stuff that transcends an individual kind of language <laughs> it i mean just to be even more pretentious, galaxy right? brain <laughs> <laughs> But it, but it isn't, it, it's true. Like these are not implementation level. Like these, these are uh, something that you can implement in a language, but it's not learning to, uh, and, and I think most people really early on, they're learning to use a language and find out, you know, what tools are at their disposal in a specific language, just to do what they're trying to do to like accomplish a goal. Um, and so like, that's kind of the, just make it work phase. And I think that that's a good place to yeah. be for a lot of people, you know, that, that can get you a long way. Um, yeah, I made a career out of it, baby. <laughs> thank you. I, I think you might be a bit beyond that, but, uh, it, I appreciate yeah. the humility. Appreciate yeah. the humility. Yeah, I know. I know you're, you're in rooms with real smart people now. So this, this, um, uh, <laughs> doesn't feel the same. Um, I don't, I don't know but, what you mean by that, but. I get to watch smart people do cool things. <laughs> That's, uh, I've heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, so you did say, um, that these are, these don't have any kind of relationship to a language and that these are about kind of problem solving. Right. And so, you you made the comparison to chess and studying chess moves and i i think that that's uh gonna lose a lot of people i want a different analogy i <laughs> i, I think i think that's good however yeah to be fair i don't play chess i i never i never got into it since my brother would kick my butt when we were younger and he was like just an older kid more developed right and just rub my face and defeat uh but i did watch the queen's gambit and really okay. enjoyed it so yeah i'm gonna say it still applies and it can be cool just can be cool yeah <clears throat> but yeah you were going for another analogy that's going to keep our listeners from uh, thinking we're a couple nerds as we uh, talk about javascript on a I podcast was trying to... <laughs> okay fair point fair point bring it back uh, grant let's go uh, is there another analogy um, why don't you I, yeah yeah riding mountain bikes why don't you pop some wheelies oh. with your uh sunglasses on i mean there's not a whole lot of depth there it's just <laughs> cramming a bike down a mountain um no i i would say in in cooking uh, right like Ooh. this oh, is yeah, yeah. This is instead of following recipes, this is probably at the level of like understanding the way that your ingredients interact, right? So this is what, what was that book like? Acid, fat, salt, McDonald's, like, <laughs> 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 right? 
Right. So like, I, I think when you get to a certain point in cooking, like you either develop an innate sense for, mm. um, like, oh, this needs more salt or like, I should like crush a lime and put all the lime juice in there, which is always a good move, no matter what it is. Limes make everything better. Um, but mm, I, chocolate, I, cake. I, chocolate cake, <laughs> lime chocolate cake. That actually, no, that people could, are into it. Yeah. I could see it. With some coconut yep. too. Okay. I anyway. Did. Okay. So, I, I I think that's another analogy that might. It's a good one. Might might work. Um. But it, no, it does. Well, hold on. I, I but that. Jump but in. but I think that's why it's so hard to describe, right? And I think that's why it's yeah. so hard. Like we're sitting here saying, "Oh, design patterns, design patterns," and I can name them, and we can talk about like what they do, kind of. But it's it's uh, it's not that simple, right? And so the the resources that are available now, I will say, are better than uh, what I had when I was starting up because I wanted to understand this stuff and I really couldn't find much, um, which is why I latched onto some of the patterns that I have kind of stuck in my head and and probably overuse. Um, because that's really what was available to me. And it's what I could kind of understand at the time. Um, and I, I think they worked well for the problems I was trying to solve. I'm very curious, like, uh, at this point, if there's anything that sticks out to you as like something that you prefer to use or kind of your go-to patterns. Um, yeah. So uh, again, this is kind of like a hard topic to discuss on a podcast because it's like esoteric wisdom and, and you really benefit from having code examples. Um, but uh, I'd say as far as design patterns go, um, like the, what is it? publisher subscriber or the sort of observable observable ones okay. um, are cool because essentially you can uh, create you can create an object that keeps track of uh, variables and assigns functions to when those variables change. Yeah, it, right? it, it maintains its own internal state. Yeah. And when that state updates, subscribers receive those updates. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I and and that's one that so I, I wrote an article about uh, observables. It's so hard to back. explain this with mouth blogging. It, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, it is it is really really difficult. Um but but I also think it's important and probably what we can talk about is like discovering when like how to find those gaps right like what are some of the code smells that you might run into where like hey you you may be able to clean up some of your own code uh like if you see these five things compilers hate these never mind which are <laughs> um so it, Spaghetti code being one of them, right? Like where... Yeah, know, but it's really hard when you're writing code to identify at what point at what point you cross the boundary of into pasta. Where, when do you start to iterate? I have my own personal rules of when I start to iterate on code that I've written, but when do you start to iterate? I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh... No, I don't know. Like, uh, it, it it it's it's a weird thing that's hard to describe because uh, because it's a, sort of the same as when you when you describe code smells, right? Like a code smell is sort of a thing that also it's like pornography to the Supreme Court. Like I know it when I see it, right? Uh, you never heard. What does that? the Supreme Court have to do with pornography? Uh, that one of the judges. Uh, there was like a ruling on what was what what what. Uh, qualified for pornography and the judge literally said well you, you know it when you see it or something like that and it's like couldn't couldn't actually like put a quantifiable or measurable uh, explanation and so 
so it's oh, super yes. subjective, right? The um, yes, the the ineffable quality of pornography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so and so, well, quality of con of like the subject matter, right? Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as code as far as code goes, it, it's weird how uh, I would best describe it as like a spider sense that 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 sense that when you when you write something when you read something eventually it reaches a certain level of complexity that is hard to maintain everything in your head at once or it's hard to uh come back to after a certain amount of time or if you're reading someone else's code um someone was saying that you know code is read way more than it's written so having code that you that you have the experience to develop the wherewithal to know I'm getting into trouble here. Like if I keep going down this path, it's not going to be a happy path, you know? Um, and that there are certain patterns that you've run into in the, in the past and developed both with experience or study or looking at so someone else's code or pair programming with people that says, Hey, you know, these are some patterns and they aren't necessarily, I wouldn't say that these things always fall into the camp of design patterns, but there are certain patterns you can keep an eye out that kind of like triggers those, those red flags warnings. And like, mm, if I do it that way, it's, it's not going to be good. And that's, yeah, where you have to start considering refactoring. And, and again, that some of it is subjective and some, some of it is, uh tried and true from the collective experience of the uh engineering community and some of it is based on you know your team okay so i didn't give I, you like a hard answer on when when they refactor or anything but uh, uh, let's hear yours 10 right, lines I'll, get, 10 I'll, lines. I'll, I'll give you my hard answer i i i live i live in three phases make it right or sorry, make it work, make it mm -hmm. right, make it fast. That's I it. I live in three phases too. You're you're Eat, a three sleep phase and party. Human. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're how many minutes deep into the show? First big eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> wah, was, wah. Oh, I'm gonna have to uh, peel my eyes uh, <laughs> off of my reticular formation. No. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, I, I, and I find myself, uh, so I'm one of those monsters that makes but a million you, that, 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 commits. That, that, hold on. That doesn't what? answer the question though. I'm going to, I'm not going to say there. let you off the hook. I'm not going to let you off the hook. Make it work. Make it right. Make it fast. Yeah. Okay. So working, <laughs> working, working, we have like a quantifiable measure, right? Like it yes. works or it doesn't work. It's right. Yeah. And it Correct. can work crappily. So then how do you, that's like where you go into making it right. Okay. Correct. Yes. So like I can make something work with like four booleans that all interact together and have to run a bunch of if statements and then handle corner cases. Uh, it will work, but I'm very much creating some bugs, right? Like okay. there's some stuff that is gonna go wrong if a user's interacting and I haven't caught whatever case they're in. Right. So then I go and I look at this code. So typically what I do, like I'm one of those monsters that like I, I open a PR uh, with one commit and then I continue to commit every five to 10 minutes until it's ready, which is why draft PRs are like the greatest thing that ever came to GitHub for me. Anyway, um, I, I like to keep uh, like... Interesting. Uh, I branch. I like to keep a, well, yeah, I'm on... Right. I mean, branch. you branch too, but you, 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 you create the PR first and then yeah. you write your code. So I, I get, I get the very base work, uh, that, that I need to get done and I make an initial commit and then I start iterating from there. And then when I'm in a position where I think the code is at least right, I will turn it into like a real PR and get reviews on it and then iterate based on that feedback. Uh, which typically isn't about performance. Um, so like the make it fast part doesn't apply to a lot of stuff. It's really just um, a euphemism. Makes me feel better. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. But to, to your kind of vague answer, I like my, my response is 
probably equally vague, but the, that <laughs> that is the structure that I follow is just kind of continuing to read through and iterate at kind of a micro level. And it tends to work out. It just takes time. And I think um, a lot of engineers want to just get stuff done and be fast. And Whoa. I... I don't know anybody that that uh, that at least initially in their career could like write really good code very quickly. Um, I think good code comes through iteration and usually collaboration. That's also something that we're missing here, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, I want to bring this back to uh, design patterns. Rain what it in. Rain me in. Well, bring us back. Yeah, uh, but yeah no, I'm just I'm just wondering what what was the impetus for like wanting to talk about this? What did you want people to listen? What, what do you want people to, to take away from this or anything? I don't know. Well, so was there there are going to be there are going to be some resources in the show notes. Uh, one of those is this design patterns catalog that I think is brilliant. Okay, it's great, um, and it's and it's also that like your understanding of building software doesn't stop at uh, when you're like at a hundred percent JavaScript or a hundred percent CSS or a hundred percent HTML. Like I see these on. What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember there was like a, there was like a phase yeah, yeah. where people were doing this. On and the resume. Yeah. On the resume. And I'm like, I don't know what 80% JavaScript means. Um, anyway, um, that, that is not something, uh, that I think helps people get jobs. Um, but being able to speak to, uh, the utilization of some design patterns, or at least knowing of their existence, um, and where you might find more information if you're facing a problem that one of them might solve, uh, that's kind of what I want people to walk away from this you know, maybe having a better understanding or like there's, there's hope there to get, to get you to kind of the next level. Not okay. that I think everybody needs to know all of this stuff, but you should know some. Yeah. Okay. I, I would agree with that. Like, I think that it's, it's sort of funny because this, this kind of um, takes me back to people that, argue on the best way to learn a language and whether it's learn the fundamentals and then and then learn a framework or start with a framework and then learn the fundamentals you know and i think both are right depending on who who's learning right like at some at, at one point you want to learn fundamentals so that when you get into a framework you understand what the framework is doing and what the framework is not doing like what the underlying language is doing I'm going to ask and, you a question here that seems obvious, but like <laughs> when you say fundamentals, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, it depends on the language, right? But fun, like, like, so you mean, uh, you mean like a core competency in the language? Yes. Okay. What else? Would, <laughs> yeah. What I mean, else you, mean? You, you, yes. It, it yes. could just be, you know, understanding, uh, uh, the pure like utilitarian how to use a language or or it could mean you know i i understand how a how a jit compiler works right where like i think i think you can get really deep in fundamentals and you might even <laughs> include design patterns in those fundamentals oh, uh, i sense I, I disagreement not, here i would not no no design patterns are not a fundamental thing uh, design patterns are like more advanced subject. Yeah. And I think it, that it's interesting, like at what point in your career, at one point in your experience, uh, do you, does it make sense to learn uh, design patterns? And the weird thing is that the further along these uh, languages and frameworks and the higher level these tools go, the less requirement you have on understanding what is a design pattern? When do you need a design pattern? Uh, why would you use it? Because, well, however, these 
tools that you use, the higher level tools, are implementing design patterns to accomplish some of these nice things. So if I use GraphQL, I don't need to know HTTP codes because it's all 200s? <laughs> uh, that that was a that was yes. a very well, mean yeah. actually word. actually actually <laughs> yes and no actually yes and no uh, so uh, all right uh, God, so, so what I'm what I'm saying like that's a little okay. bit facetious but no but it is. what it's I'm saying example. here is I agree with you like no. there are abstractions and it, and an abstraction is a design pattern just so you know uh, but these abstractions. Uh, that we call uh, frameworks or whatever further divorce us from the need to understand what's going on under the hood, some may argue. I disagree with that. And I agree with earlier Austin who was saying like, when you pick up a framework, you should understand how it's working under the hood. So I'm confused where this is coming from. <laughs> you seem to disagree yeah. with yourself earlier. No, uh, no, I'm saying I'm 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 pro I'm, pro I'm posing that there's arguments to both sides, right? People, I mean, okay. I I don't actually I don't actually have an argument on which one you should learn first. Uh, I think I learned framework. I, I did both. Like when I learned PHP, I learned PHP after learning WordPress, and then when I learned JavaScript, I learned JavaScript before I learned. Well, I mean, maybe jQuery, but I learned JavaScript before I learned. Uh, like any of the view or react or anything. Right. And I think that, yeah, the same applies to design patterns. It's important to know that they exist. It's important to know uh, what they are, that it's not, it's not the print on someone's shirt. It's also not, uh, it's also not how like a design, like a button or a pixels are laid out on the screen. It is uh, principles of designing software that are, tried and true have been have been you know used for decades and uh, are reliable um, now you don't have to memorize them all there's I don't know at least there's a lot um, and you don't have to memorize them all but it's good to know that they exist and it's good probably good to have an, uh, a reasonable understanding of scenarios in which certain ones would be useful Many of them you are never going to use for your career, though. That's true. Um, That's true. And you definitely don't need to. And you definitely don't need to memorize how to write any of them from scratch, because at the end of the day, what a design pattern is is basically uh, code written at the lowest level of the language. So let's say like JavaScript, right? You're not using you're not reaching for a library or a framework or anything like that. You're creating your own design pattern. Let's say it's like a function or a class uh, that you are writing and implement certain things that follow the principles of that design pattern and is useful to then use as a higher level tool within your code base. I think that makes sense. <clears throat> I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of reading through some of these adapter I don't know what that is. Bridge. Dude, there's a lot. They're weird. Chain of responsibility. Command. I don't even know. What, what, what would that even be? It's iterator? so generic. Yeah. I'm familiar with iterator patterns, right? State. Yes. Strategy. There's a flywheel. That's, That's a good one. Intentionally fit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, have you heard yeah, of fly, again... fly weight? Oh, that's what I meant. Fly weight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I Facade. honestly, yeah. Oh, the facade pattern is good. Okay, that one I can actually talk to. So uh, I, I actually do a presentation on the facade pattern uh, in component design. So I love that this um, is coming up like at the end of the show <laughs> that you have a talk on a design pattern. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, it's a good, so it, because I think it's a good, like this will actually be a good explanation of, of what a design pattern might be. Um, so a facade pattern, you can think of it as like the fa facade of a building is a way to basically have your building, uh, have your building structured, but then the front of the building looks a certain way, right? Like that's what it comes from is the, the French word facade so that you have an appearance of the building in front of what is the actual building behind it. And the way the facade pattern plays out in software design uh, might happen a lot when you have to communicate between two sort of systems. So an API is a good 
a good example of this. Let's say I have a library that I want to use and they provide um, some sort of utility. So the way that I present this in, in the view talk is I have my view application and I want to incorporate some uh, component library. Well, that component library provides its own uh, tools and components and uh, each of component might have it the way that it receives props. That is their decision on API design. So the facade pattern might say, well, let me take their component library and put my own layer on top of it such that, uh, such that I can basically recreate my own component library on top of theirs so that I control the layer of communication between my larger my application at large and what those components look like. So instead of consuming their component directly and following their API, I'm actually consuming consuming my own components that are built on top of theirs. And the reason why uh, the, the facade pattern is nice for component design is because it protects me from changes to their API. So, or, or if I want to change my own underlying structure, so I can maintain the thin layer of my component design with all of the props and events and whatever that I chose. And if I want to swap out for a different component library, let's say a button is a good example. <clears throat> button is like the ubiquitous example. If I want to swap out my component library for a different component library that has a different implementation of a button, and for some reason the props for that button is different, well, because I'm using and relying and building my application on one button that I own, and I'm just swapping out the button from component library A to component library B, all I have to do is change the connection between uh, my encapsulated component and the underlying library. And this protects you from, yeah, again, changes from one uh, from one library to another, or changes from an API to another, let's say like a payment gateway, you could change the API uh, the underlying API for the payment gateway, uh, or if they have, a, or if you have a, a system that remains the same system, but you upgrade or they upgrade their system, right? So they might push out new changes. So it allows you to control the uh, structure of your internal system and only at the communication layer between the two uh, do you have to make changes. Hopefully that was coherent enough, but that's yeah the idea of a facade pattern. So this, yeah, this kind of brings... Yeah. It sounds to me like API design, right? For And this is really, really common in libraries. So if you think of like jQuery, you have access to some very specific tools in jQuery, but not the underpinnings of the way that jQuery works. Like you can't get in there and like intervene with stuff. There's some private stuff that happens. Yeah, yes and no though, because you don't, you don't build jQuery, right? So... So the you build facade, a facade on yeah, top of the it. Yes, the facade pattern sits in between some external thing that you're consuming and uh, the rest of your application such that you control that layer. Some people or call least, this a wrapper. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know. So I, I may have confused design patterns as well. Like maybe it's not the facade, but I think someone has said no, that that's it's it. actually something else. But So um, it, that that's yeah. the problem with this is like, depending on the context you are implementing this in, uh, the, the literal meaning of it could change, right? Like it is like the facade pattern, but you know, be, because it's at the layer of like a design system instead of, uh, like a node library, uh, it just looks a little bit different, but no, I, I, I think you're right on with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And this is different than like, uh, like a, like building a framework, on top of Node, right? Like Node has HTTP uh, primitives that you can build a server on top of. Express wouldn't be necessarily an example of a facade pattern. That is uh, a framework, I guess. It's an HTTP server framework. Yeah, but there there are uh, there are facades that are libraries that live on top of like other HTTP frameworks. Or consume multiples. Anyway, I, I think a facade is something that you build as the barrier between your application and an external application, right? It's not 
the underlying framework that you build on top of. Okay. Yeah. There's just one more though. What's that? Singleton. Oh, that's a good one too. Get it? One more. No. Ah. no. I got you to roll your eyes and that makes me happy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so a singleton is a uh, is a function or a class or whatever you want to call it that can only be executed once. It's built mm -hmm. specifically to only have one instance, and this is important in, in a lot of cases um, where you really want to make sure that there is one of this thing around that is referenced across an application. Um, right. So this is something that maybe has like a, a heavily a heavy compute initiation process such that if you have to call it multiple times, you only want to instantiate it once and then it can be reused. Right. Or if you're depending on something that only has like in-memory state, you need to ensure that that state is consistent across all callers. Uh, and that becomes real, real difficult <laughs> uh, yeah. unless it's a singleton. Yeah. You can do it. But you wouldn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I mean, that's the cool thing about like these design patterns and understanding, uh, and understanding um, how the code works underneath and that they exist is knowing that it's there. So you're not struggling through the same stuff that like solved problems. Yeah. I've run into a lot of problems in my career where. I'm just shocked and I think this has to be a solved problem. And a lot of times what I run into when I find the solution is that somebody has applied some sort of design pattern around kind of handling that problem. Or people decide like, yeah, what you're trying to do is not a good idea in the first place. Just don't do it. That's the solution. That's my favorite solution yeah. for a lot of these things. The it's like you have to convince pattern. business it's a bad idea. <laughs> just don't write code. The best code is when you don't write code. It's like golf. The less you do, the more you've won. Yeah. I mean, you have the fewest strokes if you have none, right? Exactly. Cool. Well, did you have any last thoughts on design patterns or anything I'm to wrap us up? All out of thoughts. Head empty. Yeah. That's a great. Cool. It's all in the mic now. <laughs> I put it in here. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Well, on that note, uh, this brings us to the point of the show that we like to show some love to uh, persons, places, things, products, services, concepts, ideas. So we give some shout outs. Uh, did you, we haven't done this in a while. Are you, you rusty? You got some ready or what? Oh, I'm deeply prepared. This is something that I was prepared to, for before we even started. This is the show. why you wanted to do a podcast. Exactly. You've basically was... been putting up with the whole podcast up until this point. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Immediate disappointment. No, no, no. It's good. It's good. Let's do it. Is like, that it? Oh, hey, okay. This is a podcast though. I mean, you know, I mean, I know Virgil's. that we on stream. Virgil's. Virgil's nice. is a handcrafted soda company. So for folks out there that don't drink alcohol like me, uh, it, it, it can be kind of a pain to find something that isn't like infantilized. I don't know. Like I'm one of those people, if you're like, do you want a mocktail? Like I want to punch somebody. Um, so How about a stock tail? Bam. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Virgil's makes good uh, good soda products and they make a lot of sugar free stuff. Uh, they make a lot of like non caffeinated stuff. And for somebody who drinks as much coffee as I do, uh, it's important that I'm not like screwing up my caffeine intake by adding soda to it. So they're, um, tried and true Virgil's good stuff. Cool. cool. Uh, I think I'm going to give a shout out to two things today. Um, right. one is, uh, logical fallacies, because this conversation about design patterns um, and like understanding uh, design patterns and like recognizing them and when to use them or whatever, it kind of got me, it kind of, I, I see some parallels with uh, understanding logical fallacies, which are uh, 
logical fallacy. Like <laughs> they're, 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 they're um, issues in the way that arguments are made. Like it's usually, pre it's usually presented uh, in like debate club or something where uh, someone says like with just in the state of politics right now, people use logical fallacies to convince other people of things. And what a logical fallacy is, is essentially an argument that upon closer inspection doesn't actually, uh, isn't actually very valid because there's a fault with the logic. It's a lie. Uh, no, no. But, um, it sounds like you're talking about liars. Yeah. Uh, no, no. But a logical fallacy is like... Um, like a, the straw man one is like someone, if a scientist makes a good argument, but, oh no, that's not the straw man one. That's the, whatever. One of them is like, like uh, during the, during the pandemic and, you know, Dr. Fauci was the leading scientist on uh, epidemics. And yet people would say, oh, like if there's something wrong with his background or his accent or the way he looks and it has absolutely nothing related to the logical point that he's making, uh, then they might make an argument against him because of X, Y, Z. And that would be a logical fallacy. Like that's, a, that's aside from the point, um, you know, hasty gotcha. generalizations are one, uh, red herrings, which are like trying to distract people from the actual topic. And there's I a whole bunch of bird. Uh, it, it's a fish. Usually white heron. That's a, heron, a different thing. A heron is <laughs> it's, so yes. it's not a red heron. <laughs> No, no, herring. Yes, yes. Uh, and they're they're fascinating. Like, uh, actually, I, I think that uh, rec like understanding them and knowing when to recognize them has made it. Uh, it it's great for having conversations with people because um, you can trick them easier. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's a when good you bullshit detector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but yeah, when you recognize it, you can actually have even like difficult conversations with people and be like, well, I you know I understand what you're saying, but point that you're making is actually illogical for this reasons which makes me sound like an asshole but no it, that's it's, uh, i don't know that's a tough, good. That's a tough not, sell i don't think i've ever won an argument by telling somebody uh actually that's a logical that's, fallacy that's a logical fallacy. no um uh, <laughs> but it's it's really good it's really good to know when someone's bullshitting you for like, sure to, to recognize for that yeah um and yeah number two i'm gonna say is uh there is a podcast called um hidden brain and they are currently Ooh, doing shocking yeah Ooh, so they, good they're currently doing a series on happiness uh which has just been phenomenal like i've been i've been struggling uh lately with some stuff uh but every episode that they put out on happiness finding happiness how you consider happiness sources of happiness and like things like that man just every episode has been every episode of that podcast is generally good but these definitely stand out did um, they talk to, to dan gilbert in any of those episodes maybe okay. uh he, he's kind of he's sounds like a, familiar he's he's a really cool uh social science researcher that has done a lot of study like in that area of like specifically resilience happiness that sort of stuff probably probably but yeah, definitely worth a super worth high a quality listen. podcast. Yeah. yeah As great. opposed to, <laughs> well, let's not name any names. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, that is going to be the end of the show. Uh, for the folks that are hanging out on the stream, we are going to hang out after. Sorry, we've been ignoring or at least trying our best to ignore those comments. They're so distracting. Uh, looking at you, you know who I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out on the chat. We will uh, hang out after the show to uh, chat real time. And for those of you that are listening via podcasts, uh, thanks for hanging out. Consider giving us a, a review sometime or, you know, reach out and say, hey, we'd love to talk to you. All right, Grant, you got anything there. to... Yeah, good luck out there. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, all right. And I'm just going to throw a clap in. Whoa, that was loud. Um, golf clap. Yeah, that'll be. I wonder if I can leave like an annotation to when I need to stop. Can I leave a comment or something? Duh. Yeah, it seems like you should be able to put like a marker. Yeah. 
Cool. Oh. Oh, okay. Anyway, something like that. <laughs> uh, so what's up, chat? Uh, thanks for hanging out for the function call. It's a podcast. Uh, <laughs> so damn, you are good if it's a must to stay in character. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not in character, but... Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to know what Austin's character is. Yeah. Who's writing him? Uh, yeah. Nah, name a character. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. What I don't know where that fuck? came from. <laughs> uh, oh, because I wasn't because I wasn't so easily derailed. Mm. Yeah, man. When we do when we do the uh, the coding uh, live streams, those are definitely Stoney's got my number. Mm. But that's kind of part of the show, you know. Uh, Making but yeah, giggle. thanks for yeah, man. There was one. Stony got me on one that I checked the chat, and then for like five, for like ten seconds, I was just like, <laughs> Oh, can I say? Um, I also don't know. Uh, well, this is probably safe to say. Uh, it's it's legal here. Um, I went out. I took an edible last Saturday, and I went out uh, for a walk. There's like 15 minutes from here. There's a big nature preserve with a big like or like a small lake or like a really big pond. I don't know. I don't know at what volume of water it would actually <laughs> qualify. But anyway, um, I went there and I was just like walking around the trail there. And dude, I saw two bald eagles fly over my head and do their whatever call they make, which is not what you would think. It's not caca. It's not caca. I, ca I can't. No, it's not. Actually, that one that you hear in the movies, that's a red tail hawk. Yeah, we have those. I mean, well, you know, we have those here. Yeah. I actually saw anyway. a red tail hawk nest on a cliffside earlier today. It's amazing. It's a yeah. mess. Yeah. So anyway, you saw that, two bald eagles fly over your head? Over my head. Uh, and then I continued walking around the pond and I saw a whole buttload of ducks. I don't know what the collective noun for ducks is, but it was one of those. I saw two herons doing their caca sounds, which is nothing close to caca. And I saw a what I'm going to call a robin because it was black with a bright orange bosom that was just like chirping at me and like on this little twig next to the trail and just like chirp, chirp, chirping away. And I felt like uh, Snow White. And then, um, and then I saw these things. I saw some muskrats. I saw... You should Google it. Like muskrat. Musk rat. I either saw. Oh, you know what? That's an ugly little thing. I mean, no, you know, no. It just looks like it looks like a Pokemon. That looks like a little beaver. Yeah. Uh, was it? Was it actually a muskrat? I no. You know what? It wasn't a muskrat. I saw two nutrias. Nutrias. Oh, nutria. Oh, you know, They're... you know what that is? Yes. Yeah, that's like a beaver. Yes. Yeah, it was definitely a nutria. I saw two of them. They're super cute. Uh, they're like little, it's like if you took, it's like if you had like a river otter and put a tiny uh, capybara's head on. And I realize capybara is probably not the most, <laughs> the best example, but it's like a beaver. It's like a beaver. Yeah. It's like a beaver with a different tail. Oh, man. Yeah, it was cool. Saw two of those. They were playing and chasing each other. So you're living like a magical world. <laughs> and did chat Stony ask if I was hallucinating? No, I was really lucky, and I've had a wonderful time. And and with the, <laughs> like in the same in the same conversation as like the uh, the uh, the hidden brain like on happiness things like I am not going to prescribe someone to take edibles for depression, but I was it changed like a couple of days of not feeling great. And all of a sudden I was on edibles and walking around the forest and I felt jubilant. I felt, and not, I don't think because of like the effect of the drugs, but because, uh, yeah, I don't know, man, it was just really good. Sounds like you needed a break. Yeah, that was you, probably it. But I felt, it. I felt, That's I good. felt the joy. I felt the joy of childhood. Like I haven't felt, 
I haven't felt that sort of joy in a while. That's awesome, man. (laughs) Anyway, uh, now I know the meaning of stony. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's generally how I feel riding bikes. The joy of childhood, I think, is a great description. Yeah, because it's just like, I was just like looking at trees and like feeling the smile on my face without without having with just like being super present in the moment, you know, uh, which is funny because the last episode of uh, Hidden Brain talks about the source of happiness being awe and this idea that awe strikes us from uh, situations that we cannot explain or or need like we need a greater understanding or something like that listen to the episode it was good right on oh yeah i should probably mark down this design patterns for humans wait design patterns for humans isn't that what you said design patterns for humans yeah, is that what you said or no? No. Are oh, you okay. hallucinating? No, I'm looking. I'm looking at this uh, GitHub repo. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, that might be better than uh, what is it? Refactoring.guru. Maybe I don't know, but uh, it's pretty cool as far as like it's long. It looks like they cover a lot of different design patterns, creational, structural, and behavioral. And yeah, probably should have read some of this before we recorded. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So this is like what the G8, uh, yeah, they they define them this way. Oh, my God. It's just one long readme? It's just one long readme. See, we could have just read, we could have just read this. They could use uh, a design pattern to make this a little bit more accessible for humans. I think this works. I like long scrolling. They have a, they have a table of contents. That's, that's it. That's the design pattern. I strongly disagree. (laughs) Not that it matters. Yeah. All right. Well, shoot, I got to get going because I got to, I got to meet someone pretty soon. So taking off. It's the weekend, y'all. Uh, be safe. Let's see. What is this? Yeah, go outside. Unless it's snowing oh, still. Oh, Stoney was asking, are they writing a facade for VideoJS and JW Player or just a normal wrapper? Um, <laughs> I would recommend reading about the design pattern for the facade design pattern answering that yourself because i don't know closely enough what your code looks like um but chances are if you are sort of making your own tool that sort of encapsulates something else and provides oh this was another thing that we didn't get to in the in the talk is like one of the benefits of the facade pattern is let's say you have you're dealing with a a tool that has like a very extensive uh, API, you can actually limit the surface area by, you know, putting a wrapper around it, putting a facade over it, you could say, uh, by limiting, you can limit the surface area of what's available by, you know, using your wrapper and then also control, you know, making it more, more or less, uh, intuitive, but yeah, it sounds like you are. It could also be that the the wrapper is designed for a different purpose, like for transportation or to keep it warm, like a burrito. <laughs> Very helpful. I aim to please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, on that note, uh, Grant, thanks for the time, man. Uh, yeah, we'll do another one of these soon. Uh, chat, thanks for hanging out. It's been a pleasure. Stony. Stony, your next level derailer for sure. If there was an award that Twitch could give out, your wall would be covered. All right, folks. In, that's in it. awards? In awards for derailment. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Cool. Well, that's all, y'all. I will catch uh, chat next week. Grant, I mean, we can chat anytime you want. You know, I'm here for you. But I appreciate it. All right. See ya.